Also Wasser ist natürlich das wichtigste Rohmaterial, das wir heute noch auf der Welt haben. Es geht darum, ob wir das normale Wasserversorgung der Bevölkerung privatisieren oder nicht. Und da gibt es zwei verschiedene Anschauungen. Die eine Anschauung, extrem würde ich sagen, wird von einigen von den äh, NGOs vertreten, äh, die darauf pochen, dass Wasser zu einem äh, äh, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. children, I have a grandchild, I have a mortgage, I have a dog and I have a car. Joan Collins is um, an activist uh, from born in the north side, worked in the post office since 1979, became an activist in the union, um, then got involved politically um, with militant um, and I uh, have been a community and political activist for the last 30 years. Today, the people of Ireland said we will be silent no longer. The day we decided to roar. Who is Ron Brecher? So, I'm a, a journalist and an activist who's been involved in social movements in Ireland now for about five or six years. I'm the vice chair of the ICTU Youth Committee, which is the youth section of the Congress of Trade Unions. Member of the Greek Solidarity Committee, but have been involved in a lot of other groups previously. They want us to pay for water again. Yeah. 1.2 billion a year goes to water to our taxes. Tom Stokes is uh, a now retired teacher of media and journalism living in Wicklow. Why have they not fixed the leaks? And why have they not taken the fluoride out of our water? That is not fit for consumption! My engagement with the Right to Water campaign locally is to try and encourage people locally to get involved and it's been absolutely brilliant um, in Crumlin and Walkingstown and Drimna in the Dublin Aid area. Um, people have just spontaneously got politically active and it's been a huge benefit to them politically and everything so we just I just facilitate and work with the, the different groups and trying to help them in uh, organising their areas and that and let them run the campaign. It's brilliant. <laughs> well, I was involved in it um, from, the, from the first demonstration and probably from, uh, from slightly before that, which is, uh, which is a year now. I became involved in Right to Water in the beginning in the anti-meeting uh, protest. That's what uh, brought us to Right to Water campaign. But in, um, was it February of last year, we um, got a call from a lady uh, looking for support. She didn't want to meet her foot into the ground. And uh, people in um, Cork had uh, objected to meet us going in and stood on the uh, shores and that had stopped them going in. That I said, right, we'll do it. I've been involved locally as well in, in, in Dublin 3. We set up a right to water group. Uh, in an area where there were all kinds of um, sideline issues as well. We saw in the beginning um, as a small, very small group of people that didn't know one another um, in Dublin North East that uh, this was going to be the catalyst that would bring, um, would bring people out on the streets if we were stopping the meters, that was something that they could get involved in. More recently, was involved along with hundreds of thousands of other people in, uh, in the movement against water charges, um, uh, which is the, 
the biggest social movement in Irish history in my mind and it's been, a, been great to be involved in. I always, as I said, I always hoped there'd be a mass movement of this nature. Didn't know where it was going to come and when it was going to come um, and it came out of nowhere. The main people in the first place that I suppose motivated people to get out onto the streets were uh, left parties, uh, socialist party, socialist workers party, uh, Sinn Féin, even though some on the left accuse Sinn Féin of not being a leftist party, but I think it is. So I wasn't too sure whether people would respond to something like the Right to Water um, and it was just absolutely amazing on that Saturday to see the 100,000 people out in the streets, it was just phenomenal. But in the main it's been ordinary people in local communities who have taken up the, the reins and are doing amazing work on the ground, taking on the forces of the establishment of the state and just saying no we won't have this. But the beauty of uh, this that November the 11th after that was that you had a beginning of political activity in the communities. Uh, people who had never been involved in politics before actually stepping forward and playing a massive role in organising their communities, having community um, protests outside of the right to water as well. Um, and it's raised a lot of questions for people as well. People are questioning where we're going and what's happening and what do we need politically in that. Well, I'd say the catalyst was um, the bringing in uh, a water charge, um, a second charge, or even a third charge it is, uh, because we pay already. You know, um, I think the government of the day, Fianna Fáil, or Fianna Gael and Labour, um, thought that the Irish people weren't aware of that, and that we'd all roll over and just pay it. A number of things have played into the change in the way people are thinking now. Uh, the bank crash, the, the economic crash in 2007-2008, um, the savage austerity that was imposed while bankers were allowed to get away scot-free. All of that played out slowly. It took five or six years for people to find their voice and really it was the, that last straw, the, the imposition of water charges and, and then the other uh, insult the awarding of contracts to Dennis O'Brien, a man who was judged by Michael Moriarty, a, a judge of the highest integrity, to have bribed a, a TD and to have profited to the tune of almost a quarter of a billion in terms of state assets that he acquired. Um, all of that just plays out and in the minds of people they can see homelessness, emigration, uh, lack of employment, hospital waiting lists and trolleys and all of that stuff and this Irish water movement is their means of expressing their rejection of that austerity. And in fairness the, um, the likes of uh, the huge marches that have been uh, in Dublin organised by uh, Right to Water and others um, have been obviously uh, the catalyst as well for people uh, to come to their masses to Dublin. I wish people had made the scales of change. Uh, ordinary people. In terms of change and the change in people's attitudes, uh, it's not really surprising. Uh, the Irish were rebellious before 1922. They did, after all, create the first blow against the British Empire in 1916, and it was a very progressive republic that the, the revolutionaries had in mind. So over the last 93 years, what we've had is a media that was weighted in favour of the establishment because the media itself comes from the establishment. And so a very small proportion of the Irish people were able to hold the reins of propaganda and then benefit from that at election times by voting successive governments in that were right-wing governments. So the instigators of change in the last year in Ireland have been, in lots of cases, the uh, women who are uh, at home uh, during the day who could come out and uh, fight against the installation of water meters. 
They were the people who had never been active in politics before, in communities where there wasn't a single left-wing activist, who got together and organised a, a local uh, meeting on the question of water charges. Um, they were the people who set up Facebook groups that were able to put out counter-information to the mainstream media, and those groups ended up having thousands of people in them, and getting to know people, getting to talk to people, and having different views of the world formed in those, in those uh, discussions. The movement has grown since my first involvement a hundredfold, a thousandfold, because I think, um, as I said, you know, people in communities, uh, through, I would say, more so social media, um, they're connected and they feel, and I believe, they're connected with the truth. They're not getting the truth on local media, uh, such as the state-controlled um, RTE, and uh, the rest of them aren't much better. So uh, that's given people the knowledge, the information, where to go, who to connect with, um, how to organise in your community. Like there's a lot of um, weekly protests, or um, you know people will be signing petitions, or just standing there showing that they haven't gone away with banners and whatever. So I think this has helped the movement to grow. There are tens of thousands of people who, who will have been involved more, will have been involved in, in, in more important ways. It's a campaign that uh, really is a people's campaign. That really, it, it was built on self-organisation at a community level. And it was built on the back of really hard sweat, leafleting, postering, bringing people out to meetings, getting them to the next meeting, getting them onto the bus from Donegal, from Cork. And, Galway and from wherever else into, into Dublin for the match. Um. The movement has grown since my first involvement on the basis that what really has impressed me is the local people getting involved and educating themselves and the unions have played a key role in that as well. Unite organised a number of education meetings for people that have got had got active um, and it was from a community sort of group in the north that are active in trying to assist interface, you know, negotiations between different sides in the north. Um, and uh, it has really has really helped people understand the nature of capitalism, neoliberal neoliberalism, how it has hived off all this money over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years and how it's continued to do that and explaining explaining how it's done gives people the understanding of what we're actually facing, that this is all about um, globalisation, it's all about the big private companies coming in, trying to take our public services, take our water, take, you know, bin services, all this type of, of thing. So it's been a huge education for them and it seems to have assisted them in getting more active locally. Uh, the, the, this movement the, shouldn't be remembered for particular names, it should be remembered or the actions of ordinary people. It's also given the unions, I think, that are involved, that's the Unite Mandate, the TWU, CPSU, CWU, which I'm a member of, and the Communication Workers Union, and the TWU now have, have stepped in um, to support it. It's given them a focus as well in trying to involve their membership um, in not just workplace issues, but their understanding that it has to be broader than that. And that's the basis of the trade union movement, why it was set up. It wasn't just about workplaces, the side you're living in, housing, you know, what bread you can put on the table, food you can put on the table, your transport, your, uh, you know, wages, conditions. Um, and then facilitating that, I think, has played a good role in them getting more involved um, on root and branch issues in the communities and that. And I think also that it has played a role in trying to develop the left to work together more, you know. Can I ask, is this, is this the beginning of a revolution? Yeah. Uh, the, the movement in itself mightn't uh, culminate in what I hope it will, except for the fact that the centenary of 1916 is nearly upon us and people are starting to think already about what the proclamation meant and what sort of a, a, a republic were we supposed to have.
one that was taken from us in 1922, but it was supposed to be a very, very progressive republic. Um, and the more people come closer to 1916, 2016, the more they, the closer they come to the, the ideals of the proclamation, and they know that right is on their side. And as the communities are getting stronger, more politicised, more aware of each and every one that is um, a player, let's say, in, in this movement, um, they will see them for what they are, like they have seen Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael Labour, and the people that walked out of all these parties to set up new parties. Like, uh, and if the left, collectively, do not stand together now, it's the best opportunity we've had since the 1916 uh, revolution. What the proclamation tells us is that the progressive republic is all right. It's not a thing to be afraid of. It's, it's something that is very good and beneficial to the mass of people. So the closer we come to 2016, the more people will understand what that proclamation meant and that it certainly didn't mean the privatisation of water. Uh, water, after all, falls from the sky. There is no charge for that. They thought that they could keep robbing our taxes to pay the debts of speculators and bankers. They thought they could throw anything at us and we'd suck it up and roll over. Well, they thought wrong. There's a, there's a difference between a government that the people deserve and the government that the people think is the only option and part of the, the problem with determining which is the best government for me as a citizen is the, the, the lack of information or the bad information or the misinformation that I receive as a consumer of media and that's the only place really that we we get the information that we need to make up our minds. We're not supposed to be autonomous informed citizens. We're supposed to play our part in maintaining a pseudo-democracy. The current government are here because people want to see Fianna Fáil gone. They, were, they, don't, they weren't there in a mandate that people believed they were going to do something. A lot of them profess to care about what's happening uh, in, in Ireland today. But everything they touch turns to dust. They keep uh, ranting on about, you know, it wasn't their fault. It's the psychological, as someone made a point in the dollar there recently, sycophantic, you know, mindset that has been handed down from the Troika, that this is what you must do. Yes, it was their fault, but it's the policies collectively of the whole lot of them that has Ireland in the state it is today, not just them. But as, uh, as far as individuals and do they care about what's happening to people on a human level, my um, answer to that is definitely no. And um, when you hear the likes of Roy Quinn then, out of Labour Party thinking, um, talking about how socialists can manage capitalism, um, I think it's quite damning of the Labour Party. Um, you can't manage capitalism. Capitalism manages you. <laughs> Two men have died in the last couple of weeks in Dublin on the streets. There are families um, living on the streets. They're in accommodation. And it was 30 billion were taken out of the pockets of ordinary people and it's had a huge impact on their lives. And it's so deep-seated now. Now, if the government cared at all, they would be tackling situations like that. They would be tackling, tackling the suicide problem that we have in Ireland that is connected to um, uh, the austerity me measures that they've inflicted. Uh, their, their policing policies, uh, their privatisation policies, their, their lack of creativity and intelligence when it comes to things like public investment to reduce employment and to attract back the emigrants who were driven out of this country. It is simply one of the most dreadful governments that we've had. The housing crisis just 
absolutely horrendous. How can you have a government sitting there when we know we've 130,000 people on housing waiting lists, where you have 700 families in emergency accommodation, 1,500 children, and there's still not that urgency to say we have a crisis, we have a national emergency. Where is the humanity? Where is the compassion for people? We are not commodities, we are human beings. This uh, Fine Gael Labour government is possibly the most incompetent government that we've had, and that's saying something given the incompetence of previous administrations. Well, I can tell you now, they'd want to go back and read what Connolly left to us. He left the answers to us of how to run this country in a proper fashion where everyone will be treated equally and have food, clothes, a home. And that is what we want. So no, they are very inhuman, I think. It's outrageous that people have been taken out. With it. We've been turned to economic units rather than people having to deal with issues of raising their children, education, putting food on the table. Um, so I don't rate the government too highly. The problem for the Irish people is that since 1922, since the Civil War began and the wealthy were victorious at the end of it, we have only really had three parties, Common and Gael, Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil and Labour holding the, the reins of power. And at all times, these have been the most conservative parties. Uh, and their ambition was to stifle the proclamation, the terms of the proclamation and the vision for the future of the proclamation. Um, and so we've had 93 years continuously of right-wing governments. We're the only country in Western Europe that hasn't had the opportunity, at least, of voting for a left-wing government. And we're the, also the only uh, country in Western Europe that has never had a serious left-wing media player available to the people. So we've been fed a diet of propaganda and the purpose of that was to maintain the establishment status quo and to keep the same uh, disproportion between the wealth of the few and the, and the poverty of the many. How dare they treat the people of Ireland this way? They tell we were the frightened Irish. Well, we're not no more. We're the fighting Irish. Today, in the pity, Joe Burke, today is the beginning of the people's revenge. changed Irish politics because it's changed how people think. If it's allowed to develop um, without political constraints of different uh, the groupings and that, I think it has a huge potential to play a key role. I would love it uh, no end if we managed to for a left wing government by the time of the next election. I mean the right to change document is uh, sort of a, a ten point um, plan that people can actually say, yeah, that's what we need. We need education, then how are we going to pay for it? Okay, where's the money? I wouldn't have said a year ago that we'd have the year of the biggest social movement in Irish history, so let's see. The Right to War movement um, have brought 10 policies uh, together. We actually have the financial uh, reply to back that up um, that was done through Michael Taft in the United Union where he's actually broken down how, how you can actually pay for these things. Everybody involved in Right to Water has bought into these principles. They were amended and whatever, um, and attended conferences attended by everybody. It's gone around the country, or it's in the process of going around the country now, to get um, uh, endorsement from the communities as much as it can. Um, and that, that has to be torn away from austerity and bed, bedding itself in society now, which is going to continue if we go along with the politics of Fine Gael and Labour or else trying to put forward the progressive ideas from progressive, progressive government, progressive people standing. Um, and um, yeah, I think <laughs> it's been absolutely phenomenal um, and uh, I hope it continues and it doesn't just dis dissipate. So if we uh, have bought into this genuinely and we're going to work 
to see it move forward. Well then I think Irish politics are changed a lot more than I would have uh, thought initially. Move forward and I'm hoping that we will have um, the support of the country um, on the basis of the right to change. We do not want to be, have blood on the streets but we'll change this country and we'll change it with a smile on our face. This guy is clearly a dork for believing that water is not a right to you and I. You can shove your water meters up your ass. Up your ass. You can shove your water meters up your ass. Up your ass. You can shove your water meters. Up your Shall your water meters, shall your water meters up your eyes, up your eyes. Say goodnight, I, 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 I